Greetings, friends of liberty. When we cast our thoughts on the disturbances we find in France as of late, what indubitably strikes one is how the French, with regard to their brutal treatment of the Catholic Church, can find in their vengeful impulses no golden mean, no happy medium. Surely it is true the Church's abuses of the French people over the centuries were monstrous indeed in its enormous taxation, a taxation regarded as one part in four of the yearly income of King Louis himself. Imagine, the Church received one-fourth the amount of tax monies that the French state received yearly. In this way, the French Revolution, in part a victim's revolution of the people, erupted in the anger that led to a confiscation of the wealth the Church had accumulated over the centuries. And yet, how overboard the French go again, not stopping at a just reckoning, but now violating the Catholics' rights of conscience and instituting their own spurious state religion of reason. However, when we turn to your 21st century in North America, we also find a victim's revolution of a different sort in Bruce Bauer's new 10th anniversary edition of his 2012 classic, The Victim's Revolution, The Rise of Identity Studies and the Birth of the Woke Ideology. Well known for his many other books, such as Beyond Queer, Challenging Gay Left Orthodoxy, and While Europe Slept, How Radical Islam is Destroying the West from Within, Bauer returns to help us yet again understand the nearly incomprehensible jargon of Judith Butler's queer studies, the Marxist Mexican rantings of Chicano studies, the presence of oversized hippos and elephants attending conferences on fat studies, and the real differences between men's and male studies. After a foreword by Douglas Murray, <clears throat> he begins with a new introduction describing some of the latest manifestations of woke thinking in America the travails of Disney's woke character, Miss Marvel, the insults heaped on lawyer and talk show host Larry Elder when running for the governorship of California, assaulted and called the black face of white supremacy, and the elderly woman canceled when notifying the YMCA of a man in the locker room. And in the last decade, gender and queer studies and the spread of their associated gender falsehoods these have resulted in enormous harm to thousands of young men and women who transitioned to the other sex, to the Me Too movement with its hysterical excesses targeting innocent men, and with whiteness studies, the spread of direct racist hatred of whites, which is now infiltrated into and is promulgated by the American K-12 educational institution. All of this he warned about in detail in 2012. Let's briefly revisit some of the highlights of his chapters. In chapter one, Bauer starts us off by visiting a conference of cultural studies at that elite bastion of liberal group think, UC Berkeley. Here he describes a representative sample of woke irrationality, a young liberal who can't understand why Canadian Kim Fuck, the Vietnamese girl in that famous 1972 photo, burned and fleeing a napalm attack on a road, is now, as an adult, touring the United States, celebrating its freedom and having long since forgiven its soldiers. For this liberal, having been inculcated to view that photo as revealing of the true nature of a warmongering, imperialistic America, Kim Fuck's present attitude seems a betrayal of the photo. In another instance, at this same conference, he describes the not infrequent inarticulateness here of a woke greenie. Um, I'm like a grad student at UC Davis, sort of reviving a Gramscian-style Marxism. What's climate change? Sort of like a crisis in the human relationship to nature? A sort of like physical or spatial alienation? Moving to chapter two, he here uses 
the interesting technique of introducing a lively 1971 public discussion that, that occurred between writer Norman Mailer and four then prominent feminists, one being Germaine Greer. The very politically incorrect language used is refreshing. I'm tempted to, but won't repeat their very explicit repartee here, and the focus is direct and their emotions on ready display. It represents, as he says, a nostalgic reminder that there was once, indeed, such a thing as a New York intellectual scene, and that Mailer and his women were stars of a sort whose opinions actually mattered. Even 40 years later, one can feel the electricity in the air, the rage, the sense that the entire social order is at stake. At several points, audience members jump to their feet, shout furiously at the stage, and stomp out. This was second-wave feminism. He then contrasts that 1971 discussion with the elaborate humdrum production found in Denver at the 2010 31st Annual Conference of the National Women's Studies Association, which is dubbed this year's gathering Difficult Dialogues II. Some of the differences of this third-wave feminism were a. the fact that these huge events constituting over 340 talks over four days, took place overwhelmingly on campuses. B, the fact that with the focus on intersectionality, many, many other topics were discussed than actual feminism, so that the universal sisterly solidarity has been diluted and distorted, complicated and compromised by a variety of postmodern impulses, such as queer theory, postcolonialism, and transitional, transnational feminism, as well as by a host of competing oppressions and victimologies, often represented by non-whites, since these were more likely to be regarded as victims. C, the wide use of the concepts of social constructivism and essentialism, which imagines that some traits in others are simply a figment of the social imagination, while others, the essentialists, are real. As fellow critics Daphne Patai and Noretta Kurtke say, it's as if everything they dislike about women gets dismissed as social construction, while all the rest is the real thing. D, the idea of hegemony, used often in women's studies, which means here an entire system of patriarchal power, which in its own invisible way is keeping women down, of course. Down in the kitchen, in the boardroom, and on the shop. Floor. This invisibleness, incidentally, is what makes it an ideology. It presents an essentially fictitious, fictitious concept that, in modern America, hardly exists, just like a religion demands belief in the fictitious idea of God. Let's move now to his third chapter on black studies, starting with his revealing interview of fellow conservative writer Shelby Steele. Steele says, of a government outreach program for minorities back in the 60s, the people who ran it hired me almost immediately to help design the first black studies programs in the country. So I was one of the people who helped come up with them. I was a 22-year-old kid just out of undergraduate school, and I was designing higher education. That'll give you some idea of the intellectual heft that went into it. In numerous colleges, we talked to the administrators and talked them into having black studies programs. There was so much white guilt that you could just go into these places and they'd give you everything you wanted. We wanted our own separate departments. We wanted to grant degrees. We wanted our own curriculum and so forth. It didn't take me long to realize that we completely lacked the wherewithal to have independent freestanding academic departments. No one knew what black studies was. No one had any sort of clear intellectual handle on it. The fundamental problem is that we were trying to present ourselves as an academic discipline, but we had no methodology. In psychology, there's a methodology, obviously. In the sciences, there's a methodology. Even in literature, there's a methodology. We had no such thing at all. Nothing to give coherence or meaning to anything. Still continues. Not only were they hustlers, they were dummies. The guy I worked for was so illiterate. I was the one who could actually write a grant proposal, and that was where I was useful. You could say, we want 50000 to set up a library and get it. You'd get the money. 
So I learned what white guilt was. But very quickly, I came to see we had no future that way, that we had no respect, we had no methodology, we had no discipline. Black studies could just be anything. This eyewitness testimony by Steele himself is invaluable in showing how plentiful governmental money, combined with the white guilt of liberal university administrators, made colleges eager and willing to set up programs with this type of intellectual garbage. Thus, the intellectual virus of modern black studies entered the bloodstream of the academy and began to spread. There's much more to this chapter, partly about how much better the smaller black studies programs pioneered, by, pioneered in the U.S. before World War I, II, uh, by W.E.B. Du Bois, Carter Woodson, and others were, and partly about the discipline's regression since then, with the likes of Cornell West, Michael Eric Dyson, and Henry Louise Gates of Harvard and Beer Gate fame, while we're giving us lengthy profiles of each celebrity mediocrity. In Chapter 5, for a conference on queer studies, Bauer flies us all the way to Berlin, and while listening idly in his seat to a modern, inane American academic outlying her ragtag theories about how punk rock was allegedly a form of resistance to market-driven culture, and the Tea Party was a racist, fascist upsurge of right-wing populism, Bauer lets his narrative soon drift to the real origins of queer studies, the forerunner, gay studies, in the Germany of the 19th and early 20th century, with first-class pioneering sexologists like Karl Heinrich Ulrichs and Magnus Hirschfeld, who had started a research institute. <clears throat> On this side of the Atlantic, Wayne R. Dines, a longtime professor of art history at Hunter College, and a founder of Gay Studies in America, along with other librarians, produced Homosexuality, a research guide which remains the most substantial bibliography of information on the subject. He also proceeds to cover gay to Italian postmodernist star Michel Foucault, as well as the founder of queer theory herself, Judith Butler. Butler was infamous for her atrocious and impenetrable prose style. <clears throat> the monument to academic jargon in 1997, actually producing in an article the following sentence. Are you ready? The move from a structuralist account in which capital is understood to structure social relations in relatively homologous ways, to a view of hegemony in which power relations are subject to repetition, convergence, and rearticulation, brought the question of temporality into the thinking of structure and marked a shift from a form of Althusserian theory that takes structural totalities as theoretical objects to one in which the insights into the contingent possibility of structure inaugurate a renewed conception of hegemony as bound up with the contingent sites and strategies of the rearticulation of power. All clear? This sentence, incidentally, demonstrates exactly why we need specialists like Bruce Bauer to read and summarize these thinkers. Because I sure as hell am going to read as little of this gobbledygook as possible. Moving to Chapter 6, Bauer focuses on Chicano studies. Before showing us its rise in the various universities of the California state system of public higher education, he describes some of the early and highly influential literature of the movement. Number one, the popular 1969 poem by Rodolfo Gonzalez called I Am Joaquin, in which he identified as an Aztec prince and Christian Christ, and number two, a manifesto by Eurista Heredia called The Spiritual Plan of Atzla. In this, Heredia said, In the spirit of a new people that is conscious not only of its proud historical heritage, but also of the brutal gringo invasions of our territories, we, the Chicano inhabitants and civilizers of the northern land of Atzlan, from whence came our forefathers, declare that the call of our blood is our power, our responsibility, and our inevitable destiny. Atzlan belongs to those who plant the seeds, water the fields, and gather the crops, 
and not to the foreign Europeans. Got that, you Europeans? Bauer first shows us how liberal officials in the Cal State system, just as Shelby Steele described with black studies, caved to rambunctious students' sit-ins in letting this ethnic, nationalist, and Marxist propaganda into their universities. He then boards the flight again to meet David Diaz, the Chicano studies equivalent of black studies as Cornell West or Henry Louise Gates. Diaz, lecturer at Cal State Los Angeles, in his interview, first summarizes the progression of Chicano studies since the 1960s, then talks about its connection to urban studies and the theory of diversity, and finally concludes his interview by saying, I was always someone who believed in broader activism. Though as a youth, Atzlan was a powerful image to motivate me and my generation. We hoped that an independent Atzlan would occur in the future, but it was obviously utopian, idealistic. I don't even hear the term anymore myself, but I situate it in the historical moment of the 1960s and 70s as a motivating factor for that generation. Bauer finishes his book with two chapters, one on cultural studies, which in many ways is simply a huge amalgamation of everything we've covered so far, thrown into one postmodernist stew pot, and a final chapter entitled, Is There Hope? In conclusion, this engaging book is packed with so much information that I haven't even been able to cover 5% of it here. I would give it an A-, minus since it compares favorably to just about every book out there discussing postmodernism, woke theory, and identity studies. Why is it so good? Number one, partly because he's such a good writer. Number two, partly by the way he sets the book up, by attending conferences for or conducting interviews about each of these specific grievance studies. He can describe the interviewee or participants, sometimes using their behavior and remarks as a starting point for weaving together hundreds of additional insights into his narrative. Number three, partly because unlike so many anti-woke books, he retains his sense of humor throughout with dozens of jokes or lighthearted passages. And finally, number four, because he often tells you specifically when and how woke thinkers or their ideas are wrong, which other writers can avoid doing. Does he make any mistakes? One significant mistake but 95% of anti-woke writers make it anyway, so how much can I take off? A lengthy recent explanation describing that mistake can be found in my review of James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose's Cynical Theories, starting at the 1350 timestamp. In a nutshell, even though a conservative, in numerous instances, Bauer demonstrates that he doesn't see that the reason that woke started in American higher ed even though it's staring him directly in the face in the Shelby Steele interview, was because of its vastly reduced immunity to bad ideas, which happened increasingly after World War II, when the government greatly increased its funding and control. This influx of federal dollars and regulations enabled woke ideas to flourish because the universities taking this money used it, as Steele showed, to create thousands of departments in identity studies and politically correct ideologies. In addition, he doesn't see the Title VII and IX of the Civil Rights Acts, the sexist and, and affirmative action morals legislation passed by Congress in 1964 and 91 wouldn't likely have passed in an America whose government hadn't privileged liberal ideas after and even before World War II. This morals legislation has resulted in severely coercing by law a behavioral compliance to wokeness in governmental educational, and business institutions throughout the country. The reality is that wokeness increasingly resembles in a secular educational form the Catholic Church of the Middle Ages, with its institutional stranglehold over many societal beliefs and its ability to punish dissenters. In both cases, this has occurred by the close association with and exploitation of state power and funding. Apart from that mistake, this book, despite having been published now over a decade ago, excels in being possibly the best single all-around treatment. With the hope that it can help start a real victim's revolution. 
by the increasing victims of woke ideology, I bid you well and remain the Scarlet Pimpernel.